part two of our conversation with Edmonton radio legend Len Tucson. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Canada. I would have not gotten into radio 35 years ago if Len wouldn't have given me that chance. I was ready to give up. I'd gotten a broadcasting school. I went to this little broadcasting school called CHIT. I know what that sounds like. Mel Stevenson was <laughs> a really tough guy to learn from, but he had worked with Len Tucson before. And he told me to bug Len, and I did. And well, I got into radio. Thanks to you, Len. Here's part two of our conversation with Edmonton radio legend Len Tucson. At what point did you see the vision of K-Light? Uh, working with Larry Musser, being in the library with all of these brand new albums that go back 20 years up to today and starting to pick music and making playlists. That's how it started. And uh, each disc jockey was an individual, not unlike CKUA today. They all had their kind of groove, right? But it fit the format. Uh, Larry and Dave, Steve Burgess, um, all, you know, yourself. It, it, we're all individuals. We were painted with the same brush. Yeah. There was something about Larry Musser and Dave Welsh, which is something that I've never, I've never heard before then and since then. And I remember no. always thinking... Uh, yeah. What was it about that? That their, their little thing they did, their show, was one of the best radio things I've ever heard. One of those times in life where things click. They were one. When they got it behind the microphone, they could talk about, it was like a talk show with music. Yeah. But always entertaining. Always. They were real people on the radio. They weren't announcers. They were just real guys. And, and that appealed to a lot of people. I remember uh, going to a bar after emceeing something and Larry sits beside me and he says, do you remember me? He had told me that he did a movie with, uh, with Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins? That is well, right. Remember the, the plane movie with Alec Baldwin? I don't know if you ever heard the story. He says, Anthony Hopkins would call him at all hours of the night to say, you want to chat? <laughs> and I thought, good for you, Larry. Good for you. Hi. Okay, so you got the job. I, I like the pieces of a story while building a station. Uh, did you have an idea in your mind of who you wanted to, that first cast? That was a strong first cast you had. I guess what you do is you surround yourself with the best people you can and those who disagree with you, and many did, right? There was a lot of individual programmers going on there. And we really had a, a free reign except for the CRTC. Yeah. They kind of always put the brakes on things yeah. because, no, you can't do that. <laughs> anyway, we got through it. I, I remember... Studying your show, uh, your afternoon drive show, I'd study, I'd write down things and I'd go, okay, why is he talking there? Because I was, I, I went to middle school for six months. Yeah. But there was something about, I remember getting something out of the way you talk and going, there's a rhythm to the way Len Tucson does his stuff. And I mean that in a very complimentary way. I remember going, I feel like I'm listening to a song and you weren't like, you didn't talk that way, but there was a certain rhythm, a vibe, maybe that's a better word. Was that... When you were doing that afternoon show, were, were, were who were the guys who were influencing you? Who were the guys that brought you to that? Because you had a tight show. I loved your afternoon show. I think uh, I got into really big time people like Larry Lujak out of the States. Um, um, a lot of those formats in the States on FM that were becoming very commercial not album rock as it used to be. Yeah. They brought the clock back in and we actually mentioned the time again, yeah. right? Or the weather. And then later on, the Rick D's. Um, because radio just keeps evolving. You can't just stay there. You have to keep moving. Where's it going? Who knows? Look at it today. There's so much radio out there. It's like a Starbucks in every corner. The U.S. really, their album rock really influenced me. They called it AOR, album oriented rock. Yeah, sure. You know, remember um, um, Pirate Radio? That was exciting, but these formats didn't last a long time. They came to the point where they came, were really big for three, four years, then something else would happen. Yeah. When did you feel when you were behind that microphone? Because by the time you got to Kayla, you were pretty seasoned by then. When did you feel really comfortable behind the mic as an announcer? I think I started feeling that way back in the 70s. 
Um, Because when I put the headphones on, I was only talking to one person. That person could be my best friend, it could be you, but I, I, I totally concentrated on trying to speak as I would, would speak to you if you're sitting across from me right now uh, on that one-to-one basis. And I, I, I like to focus on that so that I sounded real. And I carried that through. Of course, when the, we hit k the, the rhythm picked up. It wasn't so laid back. It was more, let's keep moving here. Let's, and more, you know, I, I, not fun, but just energetic, just energetic. Um, so that's right here, just seeing that person right in the middle of your eyes uh, that you're talking to. Yeah. Was that a big, was that a big transition for you from becoming, you weren't in management at Ched, right? You weren't? I, no, at, at Ched I was a, a music director. Yeah. And, and any program director or music director will feel it when you say this, I feel. That's a, that's a big leap. Yeah. Were you scared? Very. Very scared. Yeah. I was seriously, I was, I could hardly sleep. I was probably stressed to the max. I used to come home and go riding my bike in the River Valley just to clear my head of all the crap I had to do yet, right? But if you weren't scared, I would have worried about you. And if you weren't scared, that station wouldn't have done what it did. That's the, that's the thing, right? You, you, you carry it. You've been scared. People who aren't scared uh, are lying. Or they're not scared, and maybe they're not going to be successful. I have to share with you something else you told me, which I carried with me my whole life, which was uh, which helped me. I remember one night you asked me to MC. Uh, I don't know what that cl- was. A club for you know we were in that little strip thing there, but there was a club closer to downtown, and Trooper was playing, and you couldn't get anybody to do it, and I don't know what it was, and and I I I, I don't know why I told you this, Len, because it was a stupid thing to say. I said, well, I don't really feel like doing that tonight. <laughs> And you had said, you know, there's a possibility Ray McGuire doesn't feel like doing that tonight. But you yeah. know what? Ray McGuire is going to get on stage and he's going to do that. Yeah. And, and you yeah. think about that and, I, and, and, and you said, go take a walk or something. And I walked and I came back and I went and I got a light bulb moment and I'm going, the show must go on. Yes. Yep. I don't know how many. I, I worked uh, so many seven day weeks in radio just did uh, I work at Christmas because I didn't have a family so why not right let the other guys have their time off you really have to be dedicated to it as you know John it's not just a career uh, it's also not a shift it's a show <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, yeah you got to be dedicated to it how did you deal with and, and even the time I was there we, we had switched a few times we went to some uh, Chaz Jenkel areas, I remember, and I like those, by the way, as a music guy, I really like those, because I learned a lot about music, then I'm going, I didn't think at K-Light, I'd go this direction, but it was interesting, how did you deal with, with uh, you know, because sometimes it's knee-jerk shifts in radio, and you have to make a change, how did you adjust to that? Uh, you adjust as you're moving, you, that's all you can do, you know, if you're making a shift to the left, or right, or down the center, um, as compared to a complete format change, which it wasn't, yeah. um, we became a pretty, really good pop rock station with Huey Lewis and the News and whatever was going on. Depeche Mode, There's some good music going on there. Touched on this yesterday about Madonna, where there was a love and hate things I remember with the announcers. Half of them were going, oh, this is crap, what is this, it's, it, it's manufactured. And the other folks in the station, I don't know who was who, basically said, no, there's something here. Uh, what yeah. were the artists that that you kind of, when you played them for the first time, you went, something's going to happen with this person? Were there? I mean, when I heard Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run, they brought it in, said, check it out. And I listened and went, holy crap, yeah. this is unreal. It was so produced, that song. Yeah. But then I got into the album cuts and I went, oh, man, this guy's really cool. Yeah. There's great lyrics. I thought, yeah, that's, this, this, this guy's going places. Uh, David Bowie, of course, when I heard Changes, right? Those early songs. What about um, Elton John? Because you got in when Elton John got in, uh, like the early El- 70s. Yeah, Elton John, I I was listening to him before he really became a huge, like when your song and Friends came out. And I went, burn down the mission. Yeah. 
he, a tiny dancer. Then from there, he just, and then by the time Yellow Brick Road comes out, boom, it's like crazy, you know, or Caribou. I mean, he, he was just on fire for all those years. Yeah. You got into radio, though, and I envy you in the early 70s as, and I, I was talking to Mark Ferner about this, I says, okay, I'm going to ask you the biggest question in the world. He says, what? I said, what was it like being the lead singer of Grand Funk in the 70s? He says, I don't have all day. He says, it, the 70s was so huge and over the top and excessive and fun and roller coaster ride. As a radio announcer, you look back feeling like, you know, things were happening. Yeah. Carol King, Tapestry. You hear it and you go, well, it's not rock, but man, is it ever good. The females are going to love it, right? Yeah. True. There's so many of those albums. they just un unbelievable. Yeah, that's the thing. I'd have to I'd have to leave you for a month and a half oh. and you come back and, and talk wow. about it because there's just so many. And yeah, Pink Floyd. I mean, that was nuts. Yeah. You know, so, so many classic albums came out in the 70s. Those ones that just still make it today, they're just so good. There are radio guys who are radio guys, and then there's radio guys who also like music. One's not better than the other, they're different. Bob McCord was that kind of guy. He was a performer, but he didn't have a huge collection of music. He used the music as his, as, as his stage yeah. to present himself, right? I'm so into music today that I, I, I listen all day. I, you know the old stereo count consoles? Nice teak wood? I just had one given to me. I ripped the entire thing out because it was tubes and awful sounding. And I retrofitted it with a, a amplifier and a brand new turntable, subwoofer, and it sounds unbelievable. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, tell me about that jukebox. This jukebox, there again, anything that has music coming out of it, I like. Even if it's a little transistor radio, it's music. So as soon as I saw it, I went, classic 60s fins like a car, windshield, right? It sounds good. It's cool. So no different than the thing I just did. I like those kind of projects. I've got music everywhere. Everywhere I go. What's in that jukebox? Like what's, just as an example, can you read me some stuff on there? Mostly it is... Um, of the era to fit the it's a 1960s box but you will find um love potion number nine the searchers penny lane simon and garfunkel three dog night chris montez let's dance tax domino el paso the council supremes everly brothers lulu uh one toke over the line which is still a funny song <laughs> so it's sort of you know 60s, 70s. Yeah, and that's appropriate. Yeah, you're doing it right because that's that's what comes out of there. Yeah. By the way, what is the name of that? What is that? What's who's that made by? That's a, it's a Rockola. Uh, it was the 25th anniversary, which says right there, and uh, it's called the Tempo Two. And they made they only they made this for two years in a row before they changed the style. It's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool at night, John. It's just like, it's like a neon sign, you know. I learned not to be scared of doing interviews. Yeah. You know, I think you told me that. Don't be scared of them. I'm pretty sure it was you. Don't, because they don't like that. And don't be starstruck around them because they don't like that. You were, the, you were actually the guy who told me that. And it's true, they don't like that. But were you ever, did you ever do an interview where you went? Um, I listened to some uh, a couple of months ago with some people. Um... There was one person I never, I just really disliked the interview, and it was David Clayton Thomas from Blood, Sweat, and Tears. It was just, he didn't care about me, and it was like somebody was holding a gun to his head at the other end of the phone to do the interview, right? And that didn't happen often, but sometimes it does. I mean, I tweet newscasters, I'm going, hey man, love that report. That 95% oh, of the time they'll go, thanks John, they don't know who the hell I am. That's right. You mentioned uh, Bruce Hornsby. The first time I heard, that was another band. I went, wow, these musicians are so good, right? Anything they bring out today is still so good. They're true musicians. I, I've been meaning to ask you this. You must run into people sometimes, and they'll say, oh, and your name, sir? Len Tucson. They go, 
It happens more often than I would expect, yeah. honestly. It truly does. It's, it's always nice, and I always like, thank you, I really appreciate that, and sit and talk with them for, you know, whatever. Uh, it's, but it's still surprising. It really is. Well, I think a part, there's always that little boy in all of us still, that little shy boy still lives, and it keeps us, it keeps us grounded. Tell me about, was there ever an interview you've done with someone that really, that, that just filled your world? Now and then I'll interview someone who really makes a difference to me. Patty Smith. Really? Oh, my God. She's awesome. She, she's so brilliant. Yeah. I, yeah, it, it's just, it's a mind-boggling interview. And we, we ended up in a conversation. It wasn't an interview. You know how that can happen? And she was awesome. Alan Parsons. Wow. Boy. Brilliant guy. Yeah. Super tramp. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Man. You know John Helliwell? Very good. Very good. Well, he's a master of ceremonies for a reason, right? I, I, yeah. But, you know, those, were, those, those guys were thinkers. Not, they were musicians, great lyricists. And, oh, imagine how, how wonderful it would be to be in studio when they were making Crime of the Century. What pet peeve, and you're Len Tuzan, man, what pet peeves do you hear when you turn on the radio and you, mine is when someone can't finish a sentence, I once lost a job to a woman, I'm sure she was the nicest person in the world, but she couldn't finish a sentence without nervously laughing, and I went, they picked her over me, but anyway, what's what are kind of habits that still get under your skin? Uh, when they talk about themselves all the time. Uh, when they talk about nothing that interests anybody all the time, uh, when they don't know how to really talk as compared to announcing, and when they say, oh, when I'm finished my shift, I go, it's a show. Did you prepare? Probably not. Uh, you can tell people who are prepared. And also one thing today in most stations, they don't tell you anything about the music. Crazy. You were the first guy who told me we do air checks, and, and, and I never understood the concept of who cares. I never understood that, wait a minute, you mean because I like it, not everyone else loves it? And there's that thing that some announcers can't get out of their heads. They forget what they're doing and who they're talking to. I forgot that once. I was with Chuck Chandler at Queen Elizabeth High School. Disco was really big, 1975. And Chuck's got the dance floor full boom and he knows and I go oh I want to do it can I get up and do it and I, he, I said yeah I'm going to play Born to Run he says oh don't do that man it'll clear the floor I said you kidding Chuck this is the best song I've heard in months I put it on the floor clears yeah. <laughs> I learned something that day not everything I think is fantastic everybody else does when we remember we used to do those things where we'd go to a club and we do you know we do the radio guy's going to play the club guy thing. Yeah, and then right. you, you've quickly learned to respect club DJs so fast. Big time. Oh, what's your day look like these days? What do you, like, I mean, you're retired. Are you doing it the right way? Or are you an A personality like me that can't stop? I'm always busy. Lots going on. Never a dull moment. I wake up early, work out. Winter's a little weird, you know, cold and whatever. But there's always music. Always. And I go to a lot of album stores these days because my daughter is really into album music. So I think of her. Wow, she hasn't heard this yet. And she said to me one day, you grew up in the most incredible time. And I said, yeah, that's true. Sales and programming. You, you, you eventually went to sales. Did, when you go to sales as a programmer, because there's that fight between creative and sales, I mean, and programming, and uh, it, there's like I didn't. You don't know it till you get in radio. People say, "Oh yeah, that's nice." Everyone has their tensions, but uh, you don't know it till you get in. And well, how did that change your perspective, or did it when you went into sales? When Marty Forbes called me, um, I said, "You got to be nuts, Marty." He says, "We got a position, Len. You know the business." I said, "Why would I go to the dark side? Why?" Why, why would I go to the side where everybody's trying to kill the format with the shit they're giving away, right? Yeah. And he said, give it a shot. And I said, well, okay. It was the bear, so that was cool. And um, it just clicked for some reason. I got it. I really got it. And I realized advertisers need to advertise. 
I'm not stealing their money, which I thought I was doing. And I made sure that I was always being honest. I wasn't selling them something that might be iffy and might not work for them. I'd tell them, i go, this, this isn't for you, you know. It, it, so it was radio. I'm still at radio. And I'm meeting great on-air personalities, whether it's Cub Carson at the time, crazy. Um, and it was still rock and roll. So it turned out really well. One more part of our conversation with Len Tucson coming up next week. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Canada.